Hello and welcome to the Angus Report. I'm Clint Mefford. This week we're taking you on a journey across the country to visit three ranches, from Cajun country to the heart of Colorado cattle country to the Nevada desert. But what connects all these places? Well, that's Angus cattle and the tradition passed down through generations. So enjoy this special episode of the Angus Report featuring films from the latest I Am Angus documentary series, Fabric of Our Forebears. So being Cajun, probably the biggest or funnest thing in Cajun is maybe just the way we talk. No matter where we go in the country or anywhere, they, they figure out you're from Louisiana. You know, we know where you're from, you're from Louisiana. 12 Star over here, we, we run about 135 head of mama cows and every October we have our bow sale and we sell about 45 bows and we care about maybe 15 to 20 heifers. I guess we have farm in the, in the, in the Roussel blood, because in the, in the early 1700s is when we have records of our family farming in Louisiana. There's nothing like Louisiana when it comes down to food and, and you know, we can go crabbing, we can go fishing. You know, where we're crabbing today, that, that was our backyard, that was our playground and growing up as kids, and still is. No! One of the interesting things is every section of Louisiana has their own culture and I took a fiddle lesson in Lafayette just so I can learn the, the music culture of Lafayette. We have a jam group, we call ourselves the P-Town Ramblers and we just play music from all spectrums, you know, and, and we just like to entertain and play and it's just a way to forget about the rest of the world. We like to have a good time. On a full-time basis, what we do is we own a store called Roussel's, and it's a, it's a jewelry gift store. I just fell in love with the diamond business and, and everything, the aspect of it, and dealing with that customer and the emotional side of, of selling diamond rings. I believe that, I guess, God sends you with certain gifts, and, and, and when something touches your heart, you know, forget about anything else you're doing, chase it. So when we started uh, raising Angus cattle in South Louisiana, I remember going to a sale with my neighbor, an uh, all-breed production sale, bow sale, and it was quick to notice that the Angus cattle were selling faster and higher than the rest of the breeds. And then I went to a female sale with a friend, and same thing happened. Angus cattle all sold. They had demand for them. The rest of the breeds were a little sluggish, and I'm like, okay, I'm, you know, why would you raise anything out? I was snake bitten with, with Angus cattle. And then it was like, all right, I want to grow me a herd that produces and, and been respected in the state of Louisiana. Everything was new to me. Being a first generation Angus breeder, but being in a retail business, we knew that customer service was A number one. And that was our first priority, customers and raising good cattle. And I know trends come and go, but if I get a vision in my mind of what I want, then I, I'm not one that's gonna stray off or be convinced to go a different way. I just felt like that Angus mama was just a great mama and, and the bow had a demand for it and trying to breed things that are maternal and low birth weight with a lot of growth. And, and that was sort of like our goal for the last probably 10, 12 years on that. On the rewarding side of the cattle, kids just growing up in the junior side of Angus, you know, I mean, they would say, what are y'all doing here? You know, you're jewelry store owners. But we understood that if you, your kids had to take care of the animals and the responsibility to learn, you know, they're the future of everything. 
you want them to express ideas because it's a changing world out there. You know, since having retail stores, you have to get away from there. You can have the hardest day of work and get here in the evening and fall in love with the outside world, you know, just getting your hands dirty and ride through your cows and, and all your problems go away. Something about being next to Yanga's cattle, it's just, a, it's just some mystique about it. You know, the immigrants, when they came, most of them didn't have much when they came, so they had a very good work ethic, a strong sense of family, and just the, the desire to do well. Most of my family and most of the people in this area, actually, are from the northern, from the mountainous part of Greece. So they naturally just gravitated when they came to an area that looked kind of like home. My mother's first husband started here. It was all sheep. They run two to 3,000 sheep. He died in 1948. My mother went back in 1950 degrees, married my father, and then came over. So my dad had like 15 or 20 cows. Of course, they were all named and everything else too, but mostly from a milk cow. I got interested in the cattle. Then I got back in 1978 and we started to grow the cow herd. My yaya, my grandma, she was, she was like a, a fierce negotiator and a, uh, and like I said, had a lot of drive and tough. And my papu was more of a philosopher and a thinker and uh, like I said, a real well-educated man. I can see it in my dad and I saw in his parents about just the, the pride that they take in their work and you kind of see that through the Greek culture as well. It's just everybody's really prideful on their work and prideful of what they are as a family and keeping that tight-knit family and keeping the tradition alive and you know and and that's you know cooking lambs on the spit and that's you know going to church and that's it's all those things tied into it and, and it's the ranch life and it's so it's 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 pretty cool to see that my, my I definitely see my father trying to carry on those traditions as well and and on the business side too you know I see you know, how my, my grandmother and how they ran their business, I can see that in my father, and he's, you know, he's a, she's a really good businessman, and he's passed that down to me and George as well. My wife was a second generation. Her parents were first generation. She was second generation, but also came from immigrant parents. She always said, if you want, if you want your children to do well and to be following your footsteps, you know, to take over your business, you have to take them with you at an early age. And then when you take them with them, you don't, you don't always make it miserable for them. Like I said, the business is not, it's not always a fun business. You have to put up with heat and dust. It's dusty and there's droughts and bad storms. And then freezing cold and wind and snow. And You're out there riding in the dust and wind all day or it snows on you and you don't have a coat. Bad calving season, bad labor. You get thrown down off a horse and it hurts. Bad market. You brought the wrong boots. If you transmit that to your kids, that it's a miserable life, they're not going to come back. But like the accomplishment of uh, like, just like Brandon today or, you know, getting the cattle work is just like, it's one of those feelings that you can't replace. And that's what we got as a young kid too, from going with our dad or our mom or whatever it be all the time, putting out salt, and rounding up cows or, you know, so it just kind of, it kind of gets in your blood and it kind of just stays there, you know? So we're lucky enough to be here and at this point to grow into another generation. This is my mom's best friend, my papu, my mom's dad. I think that's, I think that's Angelo right there, and that's my mom with her smile. It shows off her, how vibrant she was, and, and, and with my papu too. When my father really started to, to grow this operation, he had a vision that, that nobody else really saw. He had a vision of cattle and artificial insemination, and kind of where the industry would go, you know, and we started that way back then. He's always had a really, you know, mechanical mind and he likes to put stuff on paper and he can think it out and he's really good at designing things and, and you know, that goes from houses to corrals to just pretty much everything. The thing is about a corral, you have to have a kind of no cow psychology to build a good one. 
But you, when you run as many cattle as we do, you got to work efficiently. Cattle usually like to go in a circle or they like to go back to where they came from. So we try to look at the pasture and try to figure out how they like to, if they like to go uphill or downhill or where they like to congregate in certain corners. And so now I've kind of stepped into that too as, as far as I, I like to draw and I like to design stuff too, kind of like he does. And so, and it's pretty impressive when you sit back and you look at all the trails and all the systems and you see, you know, the, and how they just keep growing, you know, we kind of never stop. And that's kind of our motto is always forward. Always striving to be better. I mean, I think that's a trait from my yaya or, you know, even the ancestors came in over from Greece, always striving for something better. And that's what he was doing in the cow side of it. You know, me and George, are, are, we're millennials. We're born in a different generation, obviously. And so we have different, you know, things and different images that we want this place to go and places we want this, you know, business to grow. and. And that doesn't absolutely line up exactly with, you know, what our father or what our grandfathers have done. And me, being 65 year old, years old, and turning over a lot of this stuff to my children, I've had a little problem in transition sometimes, but I'm adjusting. It's hard to turn over. I, I remember my dad thought I was completely crazy when we, we started buying lots of cattle. But we just transitioned and he had to kind of adjust to some of the things that I was doing. At the same time, we have that in our genes and our blood, just like they did. They, we have the business sense like they did, but now it's up to us to change it so we don't go out of business. You know, leading by example is a, another huge principle when I mean, you're raising a family or children. Like I said, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have job. I mean, usually you just sell out. What are you gonna do, you get old? You can't do it. You can only do it so long. More of the wealthier people, they never return back to the really the family, the actual people that work, that own it and work it. With time, there's going to be a little more, less and less people like that. But no, I'm real fortunate that my children have taken over, have taken over those roles. But like I said, the important thing is to lead by example, and I hope I've been a good example. I live in my country in 78. You know, I was young, I was just from 16 years old. We came to this country and we come and work here. And I used to live in this bone house. That's where I lived the first time I came and it's kind of old that nobody's living in there now, so. Show me your guy's house. Which, which house? Oh, this house right here. Yeah, well, that's, that was the bus house. This, this, this is just the main house where the bus used to live. I never thought I was going to live in the house. <laughs> It was a different table, but uh, you know, we used to go in there. And the bus used to sit over here. The employees we used to go over there. And uh, you know, right in the corner it was my, my place, I guess. Yep, okay, John. I don't think that he gives himself enough credit coming from where he did. It, you know, my dad came from a family of 14 kids, and although he came over here to work when he was very young, he started working over there when he was very young. He stopped going to school to work and help the family, and you know, my aunts always talk about how they remember him um, taking them all to the kitchen and helping my grandma feed them. This is the kitchen in the house that he grew up in in Mexico. It has two rooms, but at one point they only had the one room. And they grew up on a ranch. Uh, where there, there were no electricity, there's no plumbing, there's no water. 
Um, so life wasn't easy for them. And life isn't easy in Mexico, um, education-wise. My dad, I mean, went to second, third grade, I think. And over there, it's a privilege. You have to pay to go to school. Here, I think a lot of people take advantage of the opportunities that you do have here. But um, he, he knew immediately what hard work was. Then I was like 11 years old when I had to work in a field like a man, you know, and uh, that's how we grow up. It's crazy to think about how young he was when he came over here. Um, really just a kid, really 15 year old, 16 year old kid. <laughs> I mean, everybody talks about the American dream and, and coming over and working here. And I think he landed here at the ranch and I guess he decided he liked it and he wanted to stay. That's when we hear the story of, he told my mom, all right, well, either you marry me or I'm going back and I'm not coming back. <laughs> you know, I admire my mother who 10 days after they got married went on this huge adventure with him to come over here, <laughs> not knowing anything or what she was getting herself into. They literally had two bowls, two spoons, but they'd still have like people come over and friends come over and two people would eat at, at a time. My mom washed the dishes and two more people would eat at the time and nobody complained. It wasn't like, it was just understood, just to put it in perspective of how, you know, how poor or, you know, where they started. And this is the same way it was when I come over here the first time, you know. And when I come over here at the ranch and start working, I find out it's, it's you know, it is different, but it's kind of the same thing as, as work. Work 12, 15 hours and 18 hours a day, you know, that's, I was used to, so that part didn't bother me. That's how I end up, you know in this business. I'm not a real cowboy, but I think I know what to do with the cows. <laughs> it is hard work, but like I say, you know, I have no education, so I just, I have to do the hard work. He talks about not having a whole lot of education. I think he's very humble when he talks about that because life has taught him a lot. That saddle there, it's, it's a match is fast. And that's what I used to go to Winnemucca when they have horses. I, I took my coat back inside. I'm like, I I st oh, no, 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 I'm yeah. like, no, 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 They've worked so hard for us, and I know that, that, that he does, he do, does it for his family. It's been a lot of work for him and I realize that now that I'm older. I think when we were kids, we were just that, we were kids. Everything was just the normal to us, you know. We all grew up here, uh, so it's what I know is home. Looking back, they did have some hard times raising four kids uh, on, on really one salary of a uh, farmhand's salary, which wasn't much. We had absolutely everything that we needed and really everything that we wanted. We were such happy kids here. We didn't need anything fancy. We loved playing out here, um, playing in the dirt. This is just right out here. He gave me every opportunity in the world to be successful. Uh, he taught us from a very young age, not, not by telling us, but by showing us that hard work was important, that education was, was important. Good old first day of school pictures. I remember going to school and feeling feeling this invisible pressure, I don't know if that's the best way to see it, but we knew, or at least I knew, that I had to do well to, to show my parents that all the hard work that they've done is, has been worth it. Proms, this is uh, honor society. The two daughters, they graduated in the first place, so really proud of these girls. This was my graduation, my high school graduation. And that's when she got a scholarship. When we got to the college age, you know, we were all pretty good about trying to get scholarships and, and things, and we did, but they were always there. You, you come to me first, don't go get student loans, we'll worry about that, you come to me and we'll, we'll worry about it later, and they wanted something better for us. Uh, it was probably at the end of 87 or, or 88 when, uh, when uh, my boss decided that, uh, you know, he wanted to go back to California and uh, I've been over here, you know, a long time, so I kind of know the, the job. So he told me if I, you know, just manage it for him. And I said, well, we can try it, see if I make it. I never managed it anything before. One time I mentioned to him that I like to have cows. He kind of told me how we can do it, and uh, that's how I started. 
So when he was ready to not lease the place, I have like about 300 cows. Little by little, letting him take over, buying a few cows here, taking over the lease, slowly buying the equipment, and then until it became him himself, this was his business. We were a little scared. We were like, that's a lot of work, and, <laughs> and just for one guy. I just, I was kind of scared of first when I started, you know. Am I used to spend that much money, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay it, but uh, one day I thought, well, I just do it. If I come out all right, good. If you don't, well, I do something different. So, But it, it is like when I buy the place, was start buying it, I didn't feel no different. When he was just a worker and managing, and then became the owner and the boss, there wasn't change because he just still was doing what he would love to do. Maybe somebody else, they start buying a place like I'm doing, and they probably don't want to work. I don't want to do that. I'd like to work if I can. He doesn't really think he's done much. He's just done his best. That's, that's how, you know, we started, and uh, I guess after the years, I don't know what happened, but I'm still here, so. Whatever I, you know, I am now, it's just uh, my wife support me all these years. That, that's kind of a big thing for me. And uh, my kids, they did good, so that was the other part of it. So I feel really good, you know, really proud of the family that I have. So I don't say I had the, per the perfect family, but, you know, I, I'm really proud of my family. I can say that. This, this truly is home. Now with my daughter, it's the place that I want her to, to know. You know, to, it's always uh, Grandpa's Ranch, you know. That's, that's home. They came here for that American dream and to provide for their family in Mexico and their family now and, and give us a better life than, than they had and they have. They've given us an amazing life. To think that Angus cattle were first introduced to the United States in 1873 and now graze on pastures across America. Visit Angus.org to view more episodes from I Am Angus, Fabric of Our Forebears. So that's all for this week's Angus Report. We'll return next week at this time for more cattle news and highlights. In the meantime, you can watch more segments from Angus TV at Angus.org, where you can also subscribe to the industry's leading publication, Angus Journal. Thanks for joining us.